Uh, good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to the museum here in uh, sunny and warm Washington. Uh, my name's Emily Bell. I'm the director of the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at the Columbia Journalism School, and welcome to the last of our events in a year-long program uh, that we entitled Journalism After Snowden. We started this adventure 12 months ago uh, in Lerner Hall, just over the way from the J School uh, at Columbia. Um, we thought when the incredible NSA disclosures uh, were revealed by Edward Snowden and uh, the Washington Post and the Guardian, the New York Times, ProPublica and others, uh, that as a journalism school there were so many issues in there for us to uh, examine and think about um, that would affect our ongoing practice. There were legal issues, there are technical issues, there are issues of daily security uh, and how journalists um, conduct their work. So uh, we were incredibly grateful to get immediate support from the Knight Foundation and the Tau Foundation. Uh, Len Tau, Michael Bolden for the, from the Knight Foundation and the Tau Foundation are here, um, which has uh, enabled us to get sort of stuck into this completely. I say this is the last event. Um, what we found uh, in our year's work, and we've had everything from um, a lecture series that we hosted at Columbia and, and at Yale. We had an amazing uh, day in San Francisco working very intensely with people who would not normally be applying some of their kind of thinking to the, 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 hacker, the hacker and security community who wouldn't normally apply their thinking to the kinds of problems that journalists have. Um, and we've had kind of big open plenaries like this. Well, there'll be a book uh, coming out later this year uh, entitled Journalism After Snowden, which pulls together the thoughts uh, and strategies of some of our um, key contributors throughout the year. Uh, but what we know at the end of it is that there's just a lot more work to do. Um, but it gives me great pleasure to introduce the first panel and the first session of the day where we're presenting uh, one part of what we did was uh, partner with the Pew um, Research uh, Organization to produce some real sort of insight into you know, how, are, how, how secure are journalists, how are our security practices being put into, uh, put into effect in the newsroom, and what can we as a journalism school educational organization actually do about that. Uh, so I'm very, very grateful to our panelists. I'm very grateful for you to, to, for coming along. Um, I'm very grateful to Pew, particularly Amy Mitchell and Jesse Holcomb, who've been uh, partners with us on this. Um, just before we go into uh, the research, um, I wanted to introduce my assistant director and professor at the Journalism School, Susan McGregor, who has dedicated most of her, um, what we call sort of, faculty leave uh, to digging into the um, very important issue of digital security in newsrooms. So she's just going to give you a brief overview of the work that we've done on that, um, and then we'll lead into the panel. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Emily. In the scant 18 months since the Snowden revelations, information security has become a topic of increasing focus both of and for media organizations. As today's Pew survey results highlight, investigative reporters around the world are rightly concerned about the security and privacy of their digital communications. And while more than one quarter of those surveyed report spending time researching these issues themselves, information security is not something that can or should be handled by individuals alone. Journalism schools and news organizations must educate students and reporters about these issues both in the classroom and in the newsroom. This is not a simple task, and few newsrooms have the resources to engage the kind of experts that we're going to be lucky enough to hear from today. That's why the Tau Center remains committed to exploring, evaluating, and expanding the educational resources around information security for journalists in all contexts. To that end, I'm pleased to announce the launch of Learning Security, an Intervention Report and Curriculum. This material is the product of six months of in-depth information security trainings, interviews, and consultations conducted by Chris Walker of Tactical Technology Collective and Carol Waters, a senior advisor at Level Up, during their time as Tau Fellows at Columbia Journalism School this past fall. While some of the conclusions of their report may be daunting, for example, that brief and intensive trainings are largely unsuccessful in helping journalists acquire new security skills, the insights and evaluation mechanisms outlined in this report provide valuable direction for focusing resources and development within this complex space. As we continue our work to build better tools in curricula and information security, however, we know the, place, the pace of news slows for no one, and journalists have an immediate need for skills and understandings that can help secure their work. 
That is why we're also pleased to announce the launch of a new series of how-to video walkthroughs developed for the Tau Center by security expert Harlow Holmes. These offer screen-by-screen -screen previews of how recommended tools operate and what users can expect from them. We believe that alongside resources like the Electronic Frontier Foundation's Surveillance Self-Defense Guide, these videos will make a valuable complement to in-person trainings for the many journalists whose need is now. Here to share with us more about the impact of the Snowden revelations on the needs and practices of the investigative journalism community is the Pew Center's Amy Mitchell. Please join me in welcoming her to the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much. And first, a big thanks to the Tau Center for their financial support um, and contribution in being able to conduct the survey. And also, um, a big shout out to Mark Horvitz and the members of IRE, the Investigative Reporters and Editors uh, group that uh, cooperated and participated in the survey. Uh, so I'll start by <clears throat> giving you a little bit of information about the survey itself. It is of members of the Investigative Reporters and Editors uh, uh, group, and we took their full list of survey members and focused on those that are within the U.S. and those that are practicing journalists. So not included here are students and um, professors and the like. So it is a mix of practicing journalists. We have a survey group of 671 um, out of their full, that full membership group, which is fully representative of the group as a whole. Uh, so uh, we asked a number of different kinds of questions about data security, digital practices, uh, and we uh, asked one group that's about sort of attitudes. What are your attitudes? What are your concerns? And um, you can see here, uh, First of all, you have about two-thirds of this group that says that they believe that their data has already been collected by the U.S. government. And those concerns are expressed at higher rates among the population of reporters that cover national government, uh, national security, national government, and foreign affairs areas, where you can see there you have 71 percent that feel that they probably have already had their data collected at one point. We ask about ISPs. So when it comes to protecting your data, how, what kind of confidence do you have in your ISP providers, your internet service providers, in being able to um, keep your data secure? And fully 71% have little or no confidence that the ISPs can do that. And then we asked about being able to, um, you know, if the government asks for information, 97% believe that the ISP would share their data if subpoenaed by the government. Uh, and 90% uh, uh, believe the ISP would share the data um, as a part of an NSA data gathering uh, operation. And we, get, we also had a verbatim at the back where we had an open end. We just asked people to share their additional thoughts. And this was an area where a lot of what we heard had to do with a concern being about the combination of both the ability to get information so easily and the increase in what many feel is an increase in the subpoena efforts that are taking place. Sort of the combination of those two things together is what seems to really be uh, reverberating and, and on people's minds as they're practicing their, their journalism today. When it comes to their own organizations, uh, there's, there's more of a mixed view in terms of the job that the news organizations are doing in being able to take steps to protect uh, their journalists. So you can see here, and these are asked of the group of, of journalists that work for news organizations, there is a small percentage that are freelancers. So, the, so if they are employed by a news organization, you have about half that feel their organization is doing enough and, and about half that feel like their organization should be doing more to protect them. Um, and um, again, when we asked about steps the organization might have taken, one of the things that was striking was the largest percentage, 42 percent, actually said they didn't know what kind of steps their news organization had taken over the last year. Uh, you ha also had 36 percent that felt their organization had not taken any steps, and 21 percent that said yes, their organization had taken some steps to protect them. So also a sense of, of in the verbatims, was a sense of, I'm not really sure what's happening inside my news organization. I, maybe perhaps we need either more of a collective effort or have better communication in that space about what's being done and what's not being done here. We also asked about impact. What kind of impact is this having in your relationships with your sources and in your communications with each other uh, and in, in the reporting and the research that we do? And here we see, um, you know, one of the big takeaways is that it's not at this point keeping these journalists 
from pursuing their specific stories or pursuing their specific sources. We just have 13% that say this has, these concerns have kept them from reaching out uh, to a particular source, and only 3% that say it's actually kept them from pursuing a particular story. So the stories and the sources are still being pursued. However, we have seen um, evidence in these data of um, changes in certain behaviors. About half say that they have changed in the last year, the way they stare or, shore, or store, excuse me, um, potentially sensitive kinds of documents. And about three in 10 that say they've changed the way they've communicated with their colleagues. Um, so again, some changes in practices. And then we asked further about sources, and particularly asked reporters, again, in this, in this subpopulation of reporters, about um, the ways they're communicating with sources. What kinds of steps they're taking, and then have you started this in the past year, or is this something that you've been doing uh, for a little while? And you can see the first and foremost, the biggest thing that's done is to just, is to meet in person. Uh, rather than by phone or by email. And again, this was something that we heard a, a fair amount in from the verbatims was that actually, you know, there's not, th no security measure is going to be enough. I stick with meeting in person. It's pen and paper and face to face uh, is the method that I go. Um, uh, uh, you know, less common are some of these other things like using fake email accounts, using voice encryption, turning off devices when meeting. Uh, when it comes to um, other kinds of, you know, online steps that you can take, you see here uh, disabling cookies is something that's very common. Um, turning off geolocation is something that's done. But a lot of these are things that many journalists in this field have been practicing already for some time. They're not necessarily things that they have started in the last year. And we then asked about some very specific software and tools that can be used uh, to protect. And these eight items we've been asked to keep confidential because um, of security concerns. Uh, so we, we made a scale and sort of looked at among these eight things, how many do different people practices. And you know, what's rather striking is that half aren't practicing any of these. Uh, specific software or security tools that can be integrated into one system. Uh, you do have, you know, about three in ten that are practicing one to two of these tools. And again, this was one of the things that was revealing from the verbatims um, on this front was that a, a few people commented that they don't use these things for a reason. And it's and a, a couple of people talked about the fact that it would heighten their sources concerns, and they were afraid if they were using these additional security devices, their sources might even be more hesitant to meet with them or have these conversations with them and come talk to them. And some others expressed the concern that uh, if we use these, if I use these kind of tools or these sort of softwares, it might be raising the flag to potential hackers that there's something worth hacking <laughs> uh, uh, in the material that they're having. So, you know, possibly some reasons not to use uh, some of these tools. We asked about training. What kind of training have you gotten? And 41% say they've received some kind of external training. 30% uh, is from going to a conference, attending some kind of conference or seminar. 15% uh, uh, got some kind of training from a news organization that they worked for or currently work for. So pretty small percentages there. 73% um, though, and, and when we asked them sort of what's your, uh, what's the primary way that you've learned about this, the, the most respondents said the primary way is my own research. But at the same time, 73% have done little or no research on their own in the last year. Uh, uh, to learn about these measures. So when it comes to the level of education and knowledge, um, uh, we see um, large percentages that, that, that haven't gotten very far down that road. We asked about terms. There is a general familiarity with these terms um, and a higher percentage when you look at groups like science and tech journalists, the journalists that cover science and tech, the journalists that cover uh, national security and foreign affairs are reporting these numbers at higher level. But in general, people are familiar with them. Um, uh, so they are sort of on top of what's happening in this space and, and what the terms are. And I mentioned earlier the subpopulation of your national government and security foreign affairs journalists. It's this mix that we sort of put all together in one group. And they stood out in almost every 
category um, for heightened concern, for heightened practices that they used, for um, heightened behavior changes, heightened online uh, changes. You can see the percent in the past year who have changed their storage of sensitive documents is here at 58% compared with 46% of other journalists. Um, changing communications with colleagues, again, at higher percentages. Um, using at least five out of the eight security tools. 16%, um, which is a you know, fairly significant percent when you, when you consider that 50% of the overall use none. Um, a third that, and this is another question that sort of stood out in particular for this group. We asked about whether you are concerned about losing a story to a competitor whose organization had better security or tighter security measures than yours did. Uh, and a third of this group um, uh, felt that concern as they were going through. Uh, then among reporters, and again, these are the National Security Government Affairs uh, reporters, uh, we see again heightened uses of different kinds of, um, of techniques with sources to try to work to protect their, ident their communications and their data, using fake email accounts, turning off devices when meeting, um, uh, changing a lot or some the way they communicate with sources. And again, the, um, we did hear in verbatim um, a number, you know, some of these journalists that are in here are um, not at the national level and so they're at the local level in a sense that, um, that these kinds of concerns are certainly ones that are more heightened in their minds for those that are covering things at a national or international level. But to put it a little bit in perspective, um, we asked, okay, so, you know, here are four challenges facing news organizations or journalists today. So how would you rank these in terms of their, their importance and, the, and, and um, uh, you know, in terms of the, the degree of challenge that the industry faces with them? And far and away, you can see um, the vast majority of these journalists, 88%, nearly 9 in 10, uh, ranked decreasing resources in newsroom as the top uh, challenge among these four. Um, when it came to the second challenge, legal action against journalists, again, this idea of subpoenas uh, came in uh, at 56 percent. Uh, so, you know, the, the surveillance and hacking concerns are not at the level of these other two concerns uh, at this point in time. So all in all, uh, you know, if you sort of take this whole uh, the survey that, you know, really talks about an environment of investigative journalism that has changed, uh, that many are communicating differently with sources and with their colleagues than they have in the past, um, taking extra precautions with their data. Only, uh, you know, a small minority have actually stopped pursuing stories and sources, but also it's a small minority that have had any training or at least very much training in how to work in today's digital space. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Amy. Um, now to discuss uh, both the findings in the report, but also to talk more widely about how uh, newsrooms are actually coping with um, the idea that uh, there is a chilling effect on certain types of reporting. Um, I want to welcome Julia Angwin uh, and our panelists uh, for this afternoon. Julia, and panelists, if you if you want to, if you come up, um, and I'll hand over to Julia from this point, who will be driving. Um, I just wanted one piece of housekeeping while we're um, here, which is at the end of this panel, if you want a seat for the main event, I suggest you go that way um, because it will be in the larger room behind us. Uh, there are refreshments sort of out here, but um, they'll be available to you, but I would say grab a seat because we're, we're, we're at capacity. Julia, thank you very much indeed. I'll thank you. you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay, so I'm moderating here. I have an incredible lineup of people. Um, you have all their bios with you, but I'm just going to briefly tell you a little bit about them and then about myself. Um, uh, we have at the end David Sanger, who's um, national security correspondent at the New York Times. We have um, next to him Morgan Marquis Boir, who's uh, the director of security for First, First Look Media. Then Jessalyn Radak, who is the um, national security and human rights director at the Government Accountability Project. And Trevor Tim, 
Freedom um, Executive Director and Co-Founder of the Freedom of the Press Foundation. And I am a journalist at ProPublica and um, someone who spo specializes in writing about privacy and surveillance issues. And my book, Dragnet Nation, comes out in paperback next week. <laughs> um, so, okay, requisite self-promotion over. Um, so I just want to talk about the landscape. So if you think about what um, big leaks, right? So 1972, Deep Throat sets up a relationship with a reporter, Bob Woodward. And his identity was kept secret until 2005 when he revealed himself. That was a 33-year-long secret of a journalist and a source keeping um, that relationship confidential. Flash forward to June 2013 when Edward Snowden met with uh, Laura Poitras and Glenn Greenwald in a hotel room in Hong Kong. The NSA has said that they identified the leaker within 48 hours of the first story. Let's say that they are exaggerating slightly. Uh, it, even if so, there was somebody at his home in Hawaii within several days of that story appearing. So what we have is a world where the time in which you can keep a secret has compressed from years to days. And that's a really big problem for journalists because our job is to give our sources the feeling that they can tell us a secret. Sometimes a small secret, sometimes a big secret. And the world we live in with ubiquitous data collection, everything you do leaves a data trail, is a really difficult world to operate in when you want to keep a secret. And I just want to pause and acknowledge that it's really weird as a journalist to be promoting secrecy because our job is to unveil secrets, right? And so I do feel some tension about that and I think that we should acknowledge that our job is to promote transparency, but then in service of that goal, we often need to keep secrets because the way that people in power could punish our sources is something that we have to take seriously and it's our moral obligation. Um, and so the question that faces investigative journalists today is how do you do that? This world is a really difficult one to navigate. This, the Pew data supports what me and I'm sure everyone on this panel would say is true, which is that uh, these tools that are supposed to help journalists are hard to use, not widely used, and for a variety of reasons, underfunding, but also technical cap capabilities and just time. And so we need to figure out a way to, to make it a world where journalism, investigative journalism, can thrive amid these challenges. And that's what this panel will be about. So I want to um, turn it over to my panelists, who are each going to start off with a little statement, and then we'll have a discussion. So um, I'll start with uh, Trevor. Thanks. So hi, everybody. Thanks for having me to Columbia. Thanks for having me. Um, and so my name's Trevor Tim. I'm executive director of Freedom of the Press Foundation. And if you haven't heard of us, um, uh, a lot of what we do, especially over the past year, is try to uh, advocate and explain to journalists how digital security is now a critical press freedom issue for them. You know, they no longer have the option of not learning about it um, or ignoring its benefits. But, and, and I think that the study that we just heard uh, kind of backs up uh, that issue. Um, but I, th so, you know, I think that everybody kind of understands that this is a problem, but the, the, the harder question is, what are the solutions? Um, you know, I think that people, we need to start stop thinking about encryption as kind of this technical barrier, uh, but it's more about control and control over your data and your sources. So for decades, journalists had uh, a really powerful weapon in their back pocket. They could refuse to testify against their sources, uh, even going as far as to go to jail. And this was in the face of laws that said that they had to give up their sources, or at least Supreme Court cases that a lot of people interpreted that way. Uh, but the government figured out, you know, six or eight years ago that, that in many cases, though not all, that they didn't need journalists to testify against their sources anymore. We actually saw this in the most recent leak trial where uh, James Risen was involved in a years-long battle um, for his testimony, and then at the last minute the government dropped their request for his testimony and they convicted the source anyways. All of the, the leak cases under the Obama administration um, were basically proven through uh, digital evidence and digital surveil surveillance. And encryption is a way that the journalists can take back uh, 
the control over protecting their sources. And you know, we, when you look at case by case, it has been, you know, the government goes to third party providers, whether it's email providers like Gmail uh, or phone, uh, phone providers like AT&T or Verizon, uh, they can subpoena this information in secret and the journalist doesn't find out about it until after the fact, so they have no way of pr protecting their source even if they want to. And so with encryption, you are taking this power away from the government back into your hands. So you know, I think we should start looking at it as not this extra capability, but reclaiming the rights that we've had for so long that have kind of whittled away in the age of mass surveillance. Kept perfectly to time. I'm going to be a harsh taskmaster. I want to warn you. It's all on your behalf, the audience. Um, okay, so Jesslyn. Pop watch and all. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jesslyn Radak, and I'm with the Government Accountability Project, which is a nonprofit that represents whistleblowers. <coughs> um, I direct the National Security and Human Rights Program there. Um, I am, unlike my peers here, I I do freelance journalism, but I'm not a, a journalist by in my day job. Um, I represent whistleblowers, including Edward Snowden, um, including Tom Drake, John Kiriakou, um, and a number of others I can't name right now because they haven't been made public. But what has changed for me from the days when NSA whistleblower Thomas Drake was indicted in 2010? At that point, he was using encryption in his communications with a journalist, Siobhan Gorman, um, and that those communications remained secret during the trial. The government never seemed to be able to access those. Um, he was using a program called Hushmail at the time. In the years since, and especially when I began to represent Edward Snowden, I realized the paramount importance of having to use encryption myself. And the only category of professionals who are doing a worse job using encryption than journalists appear to be, um, lawyers. Um, <laughs> I, I think you have an ethical obligation and I think bar associations are beginning to make findings in this direction that in order to adequately protect your clients, you do need to use encryption. And the use of encryption for people who are scared of it has actually been made much easier in the last year and a half since Snowden and improvements continue to be made. Um, that doesn't mean it, it doesn't still have glitches and cannot still be clunky, but it's of such importance. Um, unfortunately, I feel as a lawyer, I've had to totally change the way I practice law in this age of mass digital surveillance. Um, I use my drug dealer tactics of meeting in person, paying in cash, using throwaway cell phones. Um, it's really not the way I trained to practice law. Um, and it's sad, a sad commentary, but it's true. You have to keep your clients safe. And while I can't say for sure whether or not I'm being surveilled, I do have current clients who are under active law enforcement surveillance. And in order to protect them, I use a variety of encryption tools um, ranging from PGP to TAILS. Um, and I hope that through crypto parties, through the work of groups like Freedom of the Press Foundation um, and others, that it will become a lot easier to mainstream encryption and other protective tools that are necessary to keep not only journalists safe, but to keep your sources safe, because I'm the one who ends up representing them when they get caught. Thank you. Uh, Morgan? Yeah, hi. So uh, my name is Morgan Marquis-Bois, and as mentioned, I'm the Director of Security for The Intercept. Uh, much like Jesslyn, I don't come from a background of journalism. In fact, I have been a security engineer now for 15 years. Um, prior to working at First Look Media, I was on the security team at Google for six years. So I worked on the sort of highly publicized incident where the Chinese government hacked Google. I've done a lot of work in incident response, uh, malware analysis, digital forensics, operational security, and that sort of thing. Um, and I, I ended up um, coming into this area. There was the 
bunch of revolutions that happened throughout the Middle East a few years ago, and uh, there were people who'd seen me give talks about, about digital security in Europe, and they uh, asked me to sort of investigate the, some of the surveillance uh, techniques and, and surveillance that uh, activists were, were sort of under during the, the somewhat hot conflicts that were going on in the region at the time. And that led to sort of publishing a lot of work, actually via, via the University of Toronto in an academic setting, um, sort of about the movement of surveillance tools, the sale of and commercialization of the surveillance industry, uh, mainly Western companies selling to the Middle East and so forth. And so I started doing um, a body of research while I was still at Google uh, on the, the targeting of journalists actually as a, as a population uh, you know, by, by government surveillance. Um, and it was March last year, together with a, with a colleague while I was still there, I, I released a paper um, where we showed that 21 out of the world's top 25 news organizations had been targeted by state actors. Um, now, you know, I sort of like, journalists seem to be an uh, overly, overly represented uh, population in terms of, you know, who, who governments like to target. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I actually went to work directly with uh, a bunch of journalists, and I, I've seen, you know, uh, targeting and then the difficulties in engaging in communication security, which I sort of wanted to hit on as a point, actually, a lot of people talk about encryption tools and moving to using them opposed to being in the dark garage and talking directly to a source. It's, it's, it's a discipline, communication security. Encryption is, is just a part of it. But what was interesting to me is actually looking at these figures in the study and seeing the 13% not reach out to a particular source because of worries of surveillance. Um, you know, 50% believe their organizations aren't doing enough to protect them and their sources. Uh, so my job is to make sure that none of my journalists actually feel like this is the case at all. Um, now, it, it's tricky, and I believe that there's a bunch of stuff you can teach individual journalists, and I also believe that there's a certain amount of institutional backing that journalists need, which actually means providing security expertise directly to them, which means having people like me in the newsroom that they can reach out to quickly if they need instant advice or, or expertise. Because uh, I think what, what I would like is I would love my journalists to write stories because they're really good at writing. I'm really average at writing, but I'm really good at digital security. Um, and and so, so what I'm trying to do is actually sort of facilitate with as, as much, as little interference as possible them doing the things that they're good at um, while making sure that they don't feel like 50% of the participants in the Pew Research Survey. <laughs> <laughs> Great. David? Well, thank you, uh, Julia, and uh, thank you to the Columbia Journalism School. It's great to uh, be here. It's great to see uh, Steve Collier, Dean, uh, old friend and, and colleague. And um, the topic is um, fascinating. Uh, I found, as I was uh, listening to the survey results, that I thought it fit in very well with both uh, my own poor practices uh, and those I see around me. Um, the issues that we have had about protecting sources certainly predate the Snowden uh, revelations. And uh, while there are some things that have changed since Snowden has come in, we sometimes use silent circle now, for example, if we're talking among reporters, we don't find it's terribly useful in talking to sources for exactly the reason that was discussed before. If uh, somebody is suddenly uh, adopting an encrypted conversation at their end and they're a government employee it would certainly put them under significant um, suspicion. Um, I found for my for myself that the changes that I had to bring about were much more after I wrote about the Iranian nuclear program which I described uh, in a, a book and Times articles uh, Olympic Games which was the um, a uh, code name for the program that uh, the cyber attacks on Iran's um, nuclear enrichment effort, that had much more to do with sort of investigative uh, resources focused on me and my sources, I found, than anything that we wrote uh, coming out of the Snowden docs. And of course, we were not by any means uh, in the lead on Snowden docs. That was the Post and the, and the Guardian uh, much more. Uh, but I did have the the uh, the pleasure of dealing with a 
very large grand jury investigation and investigations into my sources and potential sources and people who've run into me in the street and people who were once seen at, in the same coffee shop I was in, even if they weren't actually having coffee with me, and uh, so forth. So a couple of practices have long been in place for the national security team at the Times. Um, we don't tend to put confidential sources in any computer system, if you can help it. Uh, the old pen and paper may actually be uh, more useful without uh, names on it. There are some positives that have come out of, I think, the era of the Snowden leaks. The NSA is now an agency that actually has to return our phone calls, that sometimes actually has to explain what they're doing. Uh, just earlier this week, uh, when the president's uh, team announced uh, uh, the year after um, changes for the NSA, we were in discussion with NSA lawyers and NSA officials they frequently respond now on individual stories. More importantly, for the Snowden documents themselves, we've moved out of that era where people were just publishing the documents and saying, gee, wow, what can you make of this? And toward that moment where the documents become a resource for additional reporting. I've been involved in three stories in the past two months that have made uh, some use of, of those documents. Uh, including an investigation into the causes of, of the backstory behind the Mumbai attacks in 2008, where we uh, were able to get some uh, useful information. Uh, the story about how the government uh, attributed the Sony hack to North Korea, where uh, the, Son the Snowden documents helped us uh, lay out uh, carefully how well the NSA had gotten inside North Korea. And then one just earlier this week, uh, on Syrian uh, government hackers who were going after uh, Syrian opposition members. Um, and that included a section about how the United States got into the Syrian telecom sec uh, area. What we found over time is that the government has gotten less um, nervous about the publication of Snowden documents uh, because I think they recognize at this point that they're out and that they're a few years old. But it's not the mass leak that tra triggers, in some ways, the individual concerns for reporters. It's the old, traditional human sources. And the main thing that was different about Snowden was he decided at some point, fairly early on, he wanted to come out and reveal himself. Whereas most sources in most kinds of traditional national security stories you're doing, that is not at all what they have uh, in mind, lest they end up being one of uh, Jesselyn's uh, um, uh, clients along the way. So uh, we try to, to be extraordinarily careful about not leaving a trace, making sure that when you meet people that you don't have much of an, an electronic footprint. That's not always possible. And what I think we learned uh, out of the uh, most recent uh, conviction in the case that my uh, colleague Jim Risen uh, was in jeopardy in, was that the government can uh, prove a case sometimes without calling the reporter. And that is obviously a very big change. Um, so yes, we do have to use new technologies. We do have to be more careful than we've been. But in the end, it's actually back to the old kind of shoe leather reporting that this is driving uh, reporters to. Um, thank you, David. You know, that raises a point that I think is really important, which is that one of the challenges of reporting and um, and source dealing with sources is that oftentimes the relationship is such that the source doesn't think they're a source, right? So there's often it's um, it's very awkward to meet someone at a party and sort of chit chat about like the something sort of innocuous and then say so. Um, how do you feel about setting up an encrypted channel? <laughs> and I always joke that um, this is sort of the sex on the first date question, right? It's like, it is not always going to go over well. And the problem is that if you don't do it from the first meeting, there is a data trail. So then you're in the situation that it's basically the, the ship has sailed, and you haven't even yet had a relationship with this person, and yet the data is available. And 
you know, David uh, mentioned sort of in a joking way this investigation that was done into his own reporting, but it's not a joke, right? It's no. a terrible... No, it was a pretty serious a terrible thing. And what, what you see in those investigations time and time again is that it's all after the fact. It's forensics, right? They can pull up every single email that was ever sent to him and look through it. So even if that innocuous before the encrypted channel conversation happened, that person is in the net. They're a suspect, and you don't want to do that to people. It's not a it's not a good way to um, win friends as a reporter is to get people, um, you know, getting subpoenaed. If I could, if I could just yes. leap in on that, yeah. I mean, you can do whatever you want to preserve your own data, but the first thing that happened uh, in the Olympic Games uh, investigation was that a memo went out of the White House that basically said if you had any emails from this reporter, um, they're frozen and turn them over to the White House counsel and then on to the investigators. So you, know, you can't control, as Julia has pointed out, what happens at the other end, which is why you have to be extraordinarily careful in about what you say in, in any electronic communication, because you're only protecting your own side. I, I, I actually, so I, I so both agree and just sort of disagree with what, what you said before, where you said, so I'm still getting back to this old sort of shoe leather style reporting. And I, where I agree is I think it's actually good for people to uh, follow their own expertise when they're doing communication security, right? So, I mean, if, if, if you feel you have expertise in clandestine meeting, then that's, that's fantastic. Um, I'm, I trust math, actually. I, I do. I'm pretty good at electronic communications. I, I have worries about people, for instance, conducting in-person meetings, um, given that, you know, you, you carry cell phones around and, and all that sort of thing. So you're actually leaving a digital trail whether or not you're, mm -hmm. you're actually um, speaking electronically or not. Um, I, I actually feel that I'm, I'm more likely to be able to verify that an electronic communication is safe than an in-person one. However, that is actually not true for a lot of journalists. So if your organization hasn't happened to hire someone that can actually, you know, lend that expertise, um, then, you know, perhaps that in-person meeting is good. But that, that supposes a certain type of source. That supposes someone who actually wants to meet you face-to-face. -face. And I think, I think the benefit of electronic communication, for instance, is that, you know, one can actually potentially um, gain a greater assurance of source anonymity, right? Um, if, if, if you're actually going to meet people in person, um, you'll always know who they are, uh, and they have to trust that, you know. Whereas you can actually sort of do this, this sort of thing online where you can pseudonymously discuss things with people. For instance, like what happened with Snowden, right, where there was, you know, sort of documents were exchanged, discussions, where he actually verified that he was an interesting source prior to revealing who he was. Um, so, I mean, obviously, this depends on the type of source that you have, um, the type of situation that you're in. But it sort of brings me to, as I said, like the, I think journalists have started thinking really seriously about this in maybe the last three, four years, um, which, which is actually, in some ways, not, not that much time. So you've got, you've got individual journalists that have come under a lot of scrutiny that have been forced to get very good at this very quickly. Um, but I think there's actually very poor institutional backing for a lot of journalists, uh, which means that, again, like a lot of people are resource, researching things in their own time, using, using free tools, then complaining about the fact that they don't work, uh, which, is, which is always interesting to me. I'm like, why do you expect free tools to be easy to use or work for you? You know what? You work for a giant media conglomerate. Why don't you tell them to make communication security a budget line item, spend $100,000, get proper software, and then not worry your journalists about learning how to use free tools? I mean, you know, I, I guess this is sort of what I see when I see this, this sort of thing, where now, now individual journalists are like, oh man, I really got to, you know, worry about how I deal with my sources as opposed to making it a problem for larger news orgs. This is like a perfect segue to Trevor's um, project, which he hasn't touted yet, but um, Trevor has really brought to the newsrooms something called Secure Drop, which is this anonymous Dropbox that sources can use to leave documents with um, a journalist. And I would just say, as somebody who's been using it and in my newsroom at ProPublica, um, there's a challenge. I'm going to make this a little bit of a tough question for you because you, you, people send you things and they're completely out of context, right? And it lands there. It's a document. It's sort of like the way that some of the Snowden documents, I mean, they landed and people published them, but they didn't actually know what they meant, right? They were just like, look at these slides. This seems bad, right? <laughs> um, and so, you know, stuff comes across and the secure drop, and then the journalist, like, wants 
to verify, authenticate these documents. And it's difficult. Uh, you guys have built in this thing where supposedly the source can come back and check for messages. As far as I can tell, they never do. Um, and so it is, it's hard, right? Because we, as journalists, do we supposedly want to give our sources anonymity, but in fact, we actually want to get in bed with them and know everything about them. <laughs> right, so um, SecureDrop, if you've never heard of it, is essentially a, a whistleblower submission system, uh, essentially kind of how WikiLeaks uh, came to the forefront like four or five years ago, where there is a much more secure way for people to get information to journalists besides email and phone calls. And it tries to completely eliminate the third party problem, which I was talking about before, where the government could potentially subpoena somebody else to get your information. Um, and it's now in about 15 or 16 news organizations, including ProPublica and The Guardian and The Washington Post. Uh, and it, it does solve some problems, but it doesn't solve all. I think there will always be these uh, unsolvable problems where you have somebody who you previously had a relationship with uh, on the internet via email or whatever communication stream you're using, where it might be an innocuous conversation, but then the conversation becomes more serious. Uh, but so what SecureDrop tries to do is uh, provide a way for uh, the initial point of contact. So if a source wants to reach out to a journalist, um, you know, uh, oftentimes the relationship is the opposite. The journalist is approaching the source. But um, if the source is approaching the journalist, they can use SecureDrop and hopefully um, leave a very little digital trail or none at all uh, so that that is uh, no longer subpoenable. Um, but, it, you know, I think the problem that you mentioned is, is actually kind of a timeless problem. You know, when the Washington Post was emailed documents from Media Pennsylvania from the FBI office that was uh, burglarized in 1971, uh, they didn't necessarily know who they were coming from. You know, the group was anonymous. Uh, you know, they they had called themselves a name, but no one could uh, prove that they were real. Even when the, the source is seemingly credible, um, like an Edward Snowden, for example, you know, I think the you know a any journalist is going to authenticate those documents with other sources, regardless. And so it, it's certainly a worry for journalists that they, they are receiving information from somebody that they might not necessarily ever find out who it's from. Um, but it, it, it presents a smaller problem than the much larger problem of, okay, now this giant digital trail is exposed and it's possible that the source may end up um, being compromised. So, you know, there, there, if there are stories that don't get published because documents can't get verified, uh, you know, that's something that's going to happen, but I, I think the, the opposite scenario uh, could be worse. Well, yeah, don't get me wrong. I want the documents. <laughs> definitely, even if they're hard to authenticate, I definitely want them, yes. But it is just, um, it's a challenge. And one of the reasons it's a challenge is that these tools are hard to use. And this is where I'm going to set up Jessalyn a little bit, because, um, you know, she had this awkward um, moment where she tried to write um, an encrypted email to, I believe it was to Glenn Greenwald, and um, she basically, uh, somebody managed to decrypt it and post it on the internet. And it, it seems as though what happened was, there's this complicated thing, which is you, to send an encrypted email, each person goes and gets the other person's key, a public key, which is usually posted on their website or on a key server somewhere. And she had obtained a, basically a malicious key, somebody who had presented it as Glenn Greenwald's key, but not but wasn't Glenn Greenwald. And so trying her best, right, um, she was outed. And this is sort of the worst case scenario of using encrypted tools is the fault, you know, that this would happen. And I live in fear of this all the time. And I would just like to add that I have made all sorts of other crypto terrible mistakes. So, <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask you, you know, how hard it is to use these tools. And I, I want to also say that Morgan, um, the reason these tools are hard to use is because they're built by volunteers. And in fact, the tool we're speaking about today, GPG, which is encrypted email, I just wrote an article this morning about the guy who makes it. It's one guy, his name is Werner Koch, and he lives in Germany, and he's been doing it for 15 years, uh, making about $20,000 a year. And um, 
he maintains the software alone and he's running out of money. He was going to quit actually when the Snowden revelations came out and then he realized he needed to keep it going. But all of all of the encrypted emails that everyone on this panel is sending is, are going through his software. So it's a travesty, right, that these are these tools are so underfunded. So I want to make it that first clear that it's not the fault of the makers and the users, right? Because we're struggling through a tool that he built in 19 you know, 97. <laughs> so I'd, I'd, I'd like to point out that I, I possibly am the one person on this panel who has actually bought and paid for commercial cryptography software. <laughs> so so I, I, I do actually use this man's software, but I actually also use software. I, I actually do think it's, I thought that your article was great, and I think it's really important to give this guy money. But I, again, it's, it's the fact that, you know, we expect individual journalists to, A, as you said, it's this complicated thing where Jesslyn was trying to mail Glenn, and, you know, she went to this... And so, wow, I, it, it boggles me that this is actually really important for journalists. I, I know a lot of security people that don't bother to do this because they just don't have to. Um, and, and there's actually commercial, for instance, GPG is a rewrite of a commercial tool, uh, which was called PGP, and you had to pay for it. Um, and so this guy wrote this, and literally every journalist I know that uses this uses the free version. My issue is, as a lawyer, um, we don't have a technologist on staff, and we never will. We are getting secure drop, um, courtesy of Freedom of the Press Foundation, which is crowd crowdsourced and funded that, which I appreciate. But we don't have an on-site um, technician. Rather, I've been fortunate to have represented a number of NSA whistleblowers who have volunteered their time to <laughs> assist in, in, <laughs> in teaching us. Um, but that said, uh, I mean, obviously, so using PGP, GPG, something where you have to exchange keys and in encrypt and then decrypt is not as safe as simultaneously chatting through encrypted means. Um, but again, if you don't have a technologist on staff and you're left to your own devices to try to figure this stuff out, even with help of crypto parties and um, volunteer technologists who offer to come by your office as Jake Applebaum did for us years ago, um, you're, it, it, it's a predicament. And it, while things have gotten easier, I, I feel safer knowing how to use the technology myself. And that said, then we have moments like finding mine and Glenn Greenwald's supposedly encrypted chat posted on Cryptome. Um, so these systems, while they provide a lot of protection, they're not necessarily 100%, and there's definitely big room for user error. Um, so I, I hope that they be continue to become easier. Um, as we move as we move forward, but I don't want to discourage journalists from learning how to use these devices themselves if they can't get a clone <laughs> of Morgan. <laughs> we do need to just clone Morgan and put him in all the newsrooms. Um, David, do you have an, a crypto horror story you want to share? <laughs> um, you know, almost all of the crypto horror stories of the New York Times have to do with attacks on our um, actual website. We had a wonderful moment summer before last where the Syrian electronic army actually took over our homepage um, and we had to, it got closed down and we had this remarkable insight which is the other thing you can do with the news is that it turns out you can print it on paper <laughs> and then have people drop it off on folks uh, doorsteps and uh, driveways um, so we had this, this sort of back to the future moment um, it, frankly our biggest concern in, and our biggest use of the cryptography is not to defeat the NSA looking at us because, you know, we're, we are in a world right now where the Justice Department has put out some rules that do make it more difficult, not impossible, for them to um, make a case against journalists. Our difficulty is that we have uh, a lot of communications with a foreign staff that is around the world. Um, as soon as you communicate over international lines, you're in a whole different world. You're subject to 702 incidental collection, as they call it at the NSA, but also the Chinese, the Russians, the North Koreans, the Iranians, everybody who I end up writing cyber stories about uh, each and every week. And um, in some ways, we're much bigger potential targets there. 
And there, part of our concern is even as simple as protecting drafts of stories. So one of the things that I actually try to do in, in my news organization um, that's, that's not teaching people encryption tools, um, because that's sort of you know, laborious and painful, so I try to get Micah to do that. Um, mm -hmm. but, but I try to teach my journalists to think sanely about security. Um, and, and I was just thinking about this because of what David said, right? Like there's, you know, we sort of journalism after Snowden, a lot of people talk about the NSA, and I think people model threat um, really poorly, which is why people are worried about terrorists as opposed to drunk drivers and heart attacks. Um, and, and it's because we're sort of worried about things that are, that are visceral and things that are new. Um, so, so generally what I, what I, for instance, having, now that I have like a news organization where I have lots of journalists that I look after and I sort of, I talk to them and, and what I see is, so for instance, there's, you know, obviously, you know, you're reporting on Snowden docs. Maybe you're worried about the NSA as a, an adversary. If you're writing about uh, democracy in China, obviously the Chinese government becomes more of a problem, especially if you have staff there and so forth and you have to communicate with them securely. I have journalists, however, that receive, um, personal online attacks, uh, threats because they write about various conflicts, or even you know, people writing about feminist issues get a whole pile of gross and sort of sexualized harassment. Um, there's sort of you know, chaotic actors, like as you said, the Syrian electronic army is, is more of a chaotic actor than a state actor, really, in terms of their actions. Um, and so I think, think for journalists, there's, for, for some people, the, the NSA is actually not, not your biggest worry. Like We talk about that a lot with whistleblowers and so forth, but, but for a lot of people, um, accurately assessing the, the type of threat that they've actually got, figuring out the capabilities of, 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 of their adversary and, and what they need to do is, is actually probably the most useful first step. So I find actually sort of explaining to people, you know, sort of sitting down. Now, obviously, personal threat modeling takes a little bit of time and effort and sort of personal interaction. Um, but it's sort of my hope that as as people spend more time thinking about this, this sort of spreads throughout the ecosystem and people are like, well, I'm actually not very worried about the NSA. What I'm really worried about is, you know, the Russian government because I'm corresponding with my bureau in Russia or whatever, right? Um, and, you know, there's, there's different problems in terms of dealing with both. So I, I think you're talking about a, a really critical point here, which is that security is hard. There are so many different... If you're talking about a big organization like the New York Times, even if you're talking about an organization that has 20 journalists that are covering different topics, there are so many different worries for so many different individual journalists, it's hard to have a one-size-fits-all solution that you can say, here, go to this website, uh, read this or watch this video for five minutes and you'll learn how to encrypt your email. Um, unfortunately, it's just not that simple. When you add the fact that the tools that everybody is taught to use are incredibly underfunded and often created by uh, people in their spare time uh, with hardly any funding, uh, that it becomes that much harder because those tools are that much harder to use and then people have to go out and find them um, by themselves. That's why I'm struck by this study. I think one of the most um, remarkable things is that 50% of journalists think that uh, their organization is not doing enough uh, about security. And then there was a large portion of them that didn't even know. So it, it, it's, it's a situation where nobody's even talking to them about this, whether they're doing it or not. And, and so, uh, you know, I don't blame the journalists in the study who said that, you know, they, they hadn't reached out to anybody about this uh, outside their organization because a lot of times it's just overwhelming the amount of information that you have. I mean, there are, right now there are great guides online. EFF uh, has one that it's called uh, Surveillance Self-Defense, which uh, kind of goes through tool by tool, step-by-step uh, -step instructions on how to do it, wh whatever kind of operating system you have. But if you take a look at that guide, which is incredibly well written, and I, I um, used to work there, and the, the people who, who wrote it are, are incredibly intelligent, but it's just an overwhelming document. If you see it and don't have any experience uh, with security tools, uh, you're liable to look at it and be like, well, I might as well not even try, because this is like 60 pages long and has terms in it that I've never heard before. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a much more of a culture thing than an individual thing, and I, and I do agree with Morgan that uh, this, this discussion needs to be happening on an institutional level, not an, not an individual level. It's worth um, pointing out that Trevor and I went and led this event at San Francisco for the Journalism After Snowden program where we met with 
digital security experts like Morgan and lawyers and uh, journalists and human rights activists. And we spent a whole day actually modeling scenarios. So like, let's say you're a journalist in Syria, you've shot some video, how do you get it back to the United States? You're gonna get stopped at the border. Um, and we came up, it was really fun. We came up with a bunch of really creative solutions for the Syria one, you know, um, for instance, um, you know, one of, I think one of the solutions was, well, do you have a friend who could <laughs> smuggle it out for you? So some of them were very basic. Um, and then some of them were pretty advanced. Like, well, there's a tool that um, actually another um, technologist at First Look, Micah Lee, came up with called Onion Share that you could actually use to transfer the files back to a colleague in the United States, and then you could destroy the files and you wouldn't have to have them with you. And so we, we wrote up these findings for the, the book that's coming out. But one thing I tried to do, which I think might be kind of helpful, is I tried to crystallize the findings from our game you know, playing scenarios. And I came up with um, three strategies for con protecting content and three for metadata. And I think I'm just gonna throw them out there and see if people agree. But um, when you're trying to protect content, the content of your communications, there's um, a couple things you can do. You could try to hide the content. So this is something that people do sometimes when they put secret partitions in their computer so that it doesn't as look as if there is even content stored on it. Um, you can encrypt the data, which is something we've been talking about a lot. Um, and you can mask the data, right? This is something known as steganography, right? The idea of hiding a secret message in public. So that if I had agreed with someone in the audience that every time I use the word steganography, they know <laughs> that that really means, okay, you know, she's told me to where the Easter egg is hidden. Um, so those are pretty standard techniques don't, and don't always rely on digital technology. You know, steganography is something you can use. People do it in Twitter all the time. It's actually known as the subtweet. Um, <laughs> so that is actually steganography where you just send a message but only one person really understands it. And my kids do this with song lyrics, right? They can talk to each other in lyrics in a way that they can hide the con real content of that conversation from me. Um, so for content, just to, you know, I, I have a, it's an acronym, HEM, H-E-M, hide, encrypt, or mask. Um, and for metadata, I have a similar acronym, which I'll offer to you all. Um, you can add noise. So this is sort of um, polluting your data stream. One journalist that um, I know of, when he calls somebody at an agency where he's concerned that person would be tagged, he then calls every other person in that department. So there's a record and everybody can say, yeah, that dude called me, I hung up on him, right? And so that's polluting the data stream is, a, is an effective strategy, um, adding noise. Another thing is to cloak, cloak your identity with a fake identity. I have a fake identity um, that I um, really enjoy. I, it's uh, I, the journalist Ida Tarbell from the turn of the century who um, wrote a groundbreaking expose of Standard Oil's monopolistic behavior and um, led to their breakup. And so I felt that Ida wouldn't mind if I got a credit card in her name. And um, <laughs> so I, I have a, a credit card with her name. I have an Amazon account so I can order books about the NSA and the Stasi and they're shipped to Ida's address, which is different than mine. Of course, I'm telling you about Ida, so it's kind of ruined the, dis but, but it does really give me um, comfort because I can go to a restaurant and make a reservation with a source and there's no record that we were there. Ida paid, Ida made the reservation. Um, so fake identity is actually a very effective strategy in my opinion, um, although I would recommend you not tell everyone what it is. Um, and then finally, uh, you can evade metadata collection, right? They just don't bring your phone, try to go to, if you want to meet your deep throat in a parking garage, try to find the only parking garage with no cameras, which may or may not exist. But um, trying to evade uh, metadata collection is also a non-digital strategy. So the acronym for avoiding metadata collection that I came up with is ACE, a add noise, cloak, or um, evade. So I offer that to you for all of your secret communications. <laughs> and um, we, have, we have a few more minutes before we go to questions, um, if anyone wants to dispute any of my strategies. I quite like them. Um, so that, <laughs> I, I, you know, sort of finding things to say wrong. So w w one of the things that I was, you know, while you were, while you were talking, I was like, not going to interrupt, not going to interrupt. I'm a terrible interrupter. Uh, but, but, but so for instance, 
the until you got to the sort of not not just for metadata actually, which is the one bit I, I guess I'd I'd dispute because for what I've sort of got written down here on the sketch pad is is data contraception, data destruction, and data hiding. Um, so of course, data hiding is encryption. Um, data destruction should be you know, well, I guess what uh, what the British government did to the Guardian's hard drives. Um, <laughs> And, of course, data contraception is making sure that you don't create it in the first place. Um, so, uh, well, uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's sensible, right? So, I mean, it, it, it's, not, it's, it's not carrying a cell phone, but, I mean, it's, it's also, you know, um, it, it sort of goes back to the whole idea of, you know, sort of encryption is, is just a part of communication security, right? And so it's sort of how you talk, who you talk, whether or not you choose to... Um, use chat or whether or not you choose to use encrypted communications or meet in the dark garage. Or, uh, that's probably not what Americans call it. What do you guys call it? A dark the underground parking garage. <laughs> underground. Yeah, yeah. Um, Can so I just say I have a really awesome piece of um, data contraception that I'm really in a fan of right now. I have something called a USB condom. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have heard of this, but when you inadvertently just plug your... Um, your phone in to charge with a USB into some public, you know, there's a lot of public USB ports. Um, one of the pins that sticks out is a data transfer pin, and there can be malware um, that is sent to your phone that could extract your data. And so I have a little <laughs> extra pin that I put between my phone charger and the public charger. Um, it's just my favorite privacy gimmick of the moment, so I wanted to share that. <laughs> And, you know, one of the most fascinating things that we learned in the Snowden documents was a program which I had run across when I was working on the uh, Iran nuclear uh, part, which was a wonderful NSA uh, program that enables them to beam in and out of computers that are off the network. How many companies do we know or individuals who think, well, if I just don't connect my computer to uh, the Internet, I've solved my problem and you solved your problem until you run into the first idiot with a USB that isn't protected the way Julia is. Uh, and in fact, in the Snowden documents is a, an interesting uh, description of a, um, of a program, in fact, a complete product catalog of uh, machinery that can work up to seven miles away, that can beam right into a computer that already has a, uh, a network beacon in it, some kind of hardware, or, and sometimes a software hack into it. And other Snowden docs tell you about the NSA program to intercept networking equipment and so forth and put those beacons in. And in many ways, I consider this to be the most interesting stuff in the Snowden documents because we knew a lot, not everything that we uh, learned from Snowden, but we knew a lot about the fact that uh, the NSA was uh, collecting, doing warrantless wiretapping and so forth. We learned a lot of scale from it, from the uh, Snowden documents. But the technology of leaping these air gaps is, uh, is a pretty fascinating one. And one of the things that uh, the intelligence agencies wanted to hold closest uh, during the, uh, just a few years ago as they were doing, uh, doing Iran. So I, just, just one point. You, you, so you're talking about the ant catalog, which has mm -hmm. lots of the NSA's gro groovy gadgets. Yep. It's never actually been acknowledged that those were Snowden documents. Those are NSA documents. However, I was, I was sort of thinking about this because there was some contention about it, right? So there's a, like, you know, uh, there, the, the Spiegel article doesn't actually mention them as Snowden documents That's true. At all. That's and true. So, it, they know. did appear first in Der Spiegel, and I think on their website they still keep all of them there. Yeah, yeah. yeah but. They may, they, they may not be Snowden documents. They may not I be guess the, Okay. You know. <laughs> well, the lesson of the Snowden documents is that you could never be too paranoid. I mean, I feel like a year ago, if I told you I had a USB condom, you would have thrown me out of the room. But now you're like, yeah, yeah, that seems legit, right? And so, um, you know, and what's disturbing about it is many of the things in the Snowden documents, as David said, are really offensive capabilities, sort of cyber war, right? And so... In theory, this missile is not aimed at me. And um, in theory, we're in favor of these missiles being aimed at bad people. But the problem is that Morgan's research at Citizen Lab has shown that there are so many governments out there that are aiming these missiles at journalists, and that even if the US government isn't aiming it at US journalists, the other governments may well be aiming it at us. And so the, uh, the rise of the offensive capabilities being targeted against people who really are, in many ways, defenseless is, um, a really disturbing trend. 
And I think with that, we should open to questions. But do you want to add something? Yeah, no, I just wanted to say one thing. In terms of reporters saying they don't want to use encryption for fear of scaring off sources, um, with clients, you know, I yes, there's that concern. You don't want to frighten the daylights out of them. But at the same time, I frame it as, look, this is a way to protect you and to insulate you further, particularly for those who might even think they might be under surveillance. Um, as we know, the NSA, whatever the status of source reporter, um, reporter source privilege might be, which is pretty precarious right now, attorney-client privilege still exists, but there's no carve-out in the 215 metadata collection, bulk collection program, where they're saying, oh, gee, we're not gonna look at that because it's between an attorney and a source. Um, when I first blew the whistle, um, the journalist with whom I communicated, Michael Isakoff of Newsweek, the government got a hold of our communications with each other, of all the metadata about those communications, and we're talking around 2003. And at the time, neither of us had any idea how that possibly could have happened because <laughs> the government didn't have, right, ner the chuckles now, but, um, you know, the government didn't have a tap and trace. It, there were no subpoenas. Um, and now it seems pretty clear how that could have happened. And there have been similar issues that have arisen in discovery in a number of these Espionage Act prosecutions, as there have been in other terrorism prosecutions where there's been a question of, how did the prosecution, in this case the government, get access to that data? So when, with a client, when I insist on engaging in at least a minimum level of protective measures, including certain basic encryption, I frame it as a way to look out for them and further protect them. And that goes for everything from meeting in the Olive Garden, the 21st century underground parking garage, um, <laughs> To, to using Wicker, to using secure chat for instant messages, to using PGP, to using o OTR, Jabber, Tor, ADM, everything else that's available in that spectrum. Good, let's open up for questions. I think the mics are coming around. Oh, Steve Winters. Uh, there seems to be some discussion now, uh, you know, get uh, statements from Britain or uh, what, I, I would like to know what the panel, if they've even thought what the situation would be if encryption became illegal and you couldn't use it. I mean, because this is a real possibility. So how, how would you foresee a future if that were to happen? Will we'll start using Chinese hardware? <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, it's a serious question. I'm sure I, it's occurred it, to you. This is, this is a serious answer, though. I mean, I'm just it, uh, so I mean, it was it was a joke that a friend of mine actually made online, right? It's, that, so it's like, well, you know, U.S. government is going to coerce cell phone manufacturers, Apple, Android, and that sort of thing, to backdoor their crypto. You know, David Cameron's going to, you know, stamp down on encryption problems in the in the U.K. Oh, problems for, but I mean, there's so there's there's a variety of things that are short sighted about that, which I'll, I'll I'll speak to in a second. But a friend of mine who who lives in Asia uh, sort of pointed out that he was like well, there's no talk of this over here at the moment, so, you know, maybe all the manufacturing and operating system stuff, you know, just, just buy all your stuff out here. Um, just, I mean, I, I think, I think it's, it's, it's sort of short-sighted and it's going to handicap um, industry, definitely, definitely in, in Silicon Valley and, and probably more so in the UK. But where, where I think it's especially short-sighted is this, this sort of presupposes uh, that only bad people use encryption. Um, now, now, journalists actually probably fall under the category of bad people for, for, for David Cameron and, 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 and you know, the, the FBI. However, um, there, there's a great piece written by Sarah Jiang uh, called Surveillance Starts at Home. And, and we're seeing a rise in the use of, of, of basically sort of crude spyware, uh, which sort of gets installed on people's cell phones and that sort of thing for, for tracking. I mean, it sort of started with the idea of you know, tracking your children. Uh, and seeing what they were up to, seeing who they met up with, who they talked to online, and so forth. Uh, but it, but it's, it's, it's found that it's being used more and more commonly in intimate partner violence. 
Um, and then, of course, you have high-risk communities, you know, homosexuality being illegal in Russia and, and, and so forth. So, I mean, you've, you've got people all over the world that, that benefit greatly from encrypted communications. So this kind of like, we really need to make sure no one has encrypted comms so we can protect ourselves from the bad people. It's, it's, as I said, I think it's a, a really dangerous way of framing that discussion. Um, so there's also a, a second aspect to that, that the government wouldn't actually be able to outlaw encryption itself. What they would do was would be to uh, force companies to, that use encryption to decrypt their communications. So uh, a Google or a Facebook, for example, uh, potentially could, by law, be forced to do this. But there are these open source projects like GPG um, that we've been talking about, email encryption or off the record, which are completely open source, which are essentially just code that are that is out in the wild. And th this whole argument happened about 20 years ago in the early 90s. Uh, the first crypto wars, they call it, apparently we're in the second now uh, because it's coming up again. But where there's a series of court cases where the government tried to prosecute people, uh, Phil Zimmerman, actually the inventor of PGP, was uh, attempted to be prosecuted for uh, creating this code. And, and in these cases, it was, it was quite clear that uh, the code is speech and is, and is protected uh, by the First Amendment as such. So it's not that we will lose encryption completely. It's that we'll, we, we will lose the ubiquitous encryption, the encryption that probably helps the most, where uh, essentially these giant companies decide to encrypt their products so that they can't access them. And then everybody's using encryption, so it becomes a lot easier for sources to use. I just want to leap on something that Trevor said at the end there. Um, the most fascinating, to my mind, development in the post-Snowden period has been the brewing war between Silicon Valley and the government after years of cooperation, even if it was tacit cooperation. And you saw it in its um, greatest uh, uh, full flower when uh, Apple, in the update to the um, operating system uh, for the iPhone, just around the time the iPhone 6 came out, did what just what Trevor said, which was design a system in which Apple no longer held the key so that there would be automated encryption of what's on your phone, not what's up in the cloud and so forth, but that if the FBI came along with a perfectly valid warrant st stuck to the iPhone and said, dump out all this for me, uh, they would basically get gibberish. And Apple's own backup documents say it would be five and a half years of um, de-encryption time uh, using supercomputers to be able to, to, uh, to get through this. Now, we don't know if that's an accurate time period or not, but this is what sent Director Comey of the FBI, the heads of many of the intel agencies, over the edge on the encryption uh, issue. And this is one that the White House has yet to declare itself on yet. And, uh, that's going to be a, a pretty interesting fight this year. This 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 update that that David mentioned is actually what uh what switched me to become an iPhone user after being a long time Android <laughs> Android person. This, I was some so, so, solidly good in security engineering on behalf of Apple. Um, so. Next question. Hi, I'm Courtney Raj with the Committee to Protect Journalists. Um, we're in the most dangerous period for journalists now, both in terms of physical and digital security. And I wonder to what extent do you see this going beyond kind of the national security, um, governmental reporters, to really turning into a culture of security? Um, what's the status of journalism schools integrating digital security into the basic practices um, that journalists learn? And to what extent do you think that, um, it was interesting to hear you bring up the UK example because there have been such abuses there, but there seems to be less of an outcry among the public. So what do you think the extent abroad um, and also in newsrooms that aren't as well resourced as you know, the New York Times or ProPublica in terms of integrating a culture of security around these issues? I think it's a good question. I think basically where the way I see it from my 
small little window into this world is that um, journalists at all levels um, uh, are really concerned and interested, and I think the Pew study shows this, that they're interested in this topic, but they don't know what to do. And I get approached all the time by journalists at local papers or, or outlets that say to me, you know, I'm just concerned. I think the police chief might be doing something, but I don't really know what. And the truth is that the surveillance tools these days, are, it's not just the NSA. You can buy off the shelf um, all sorts of things to surveil um, your neighbors, not to mention police chiefs buying you know, things to connect to your cell phone called stingrays, and they drive around, take pictures of people's cars with these automatic license plate readers. So there's a lot of surveillance that's happening at all levels, but journalists are lacking resources, particularly at the local level, to protect themselves. Uh so I just wanted to give uh, to your, the first half of your question a, a few quick examples of um, non-national security journalists recently who have had trouble where digital security may have helped. Uh, so for example, less than a year ago it came out that a blogger who was uh, investigating the, a new uh, Microsoft Windows, the, the new Microsoft Windows source code was leaked to him through his own Hotmail uh, email account, which is owned by Microsoft. Microsoft actually went into his uh, Hotmail account and figured out who the source was, and they did this all without a warrant. Um, so he was a, a tech blogger, essentially. Um, they are, uh, if you've heard of Sheriff Joe from Arizona, he once subpoenaed an al alternative weekly uh, in Phoenix called the Phoenix New Times. He asked for pretty much everything you could imagine about the reporters, including uh, not, not just the reporters, but actually the IP addresses of the readers of the stories that uh, went to the Phoenix New Times website to read about him. Um, Balco, uh, the steroid scandal from uh, almost a decade ago now, the San Francisco Chronicle reporters who were, I believe, normally sports reporters were uh, subpoenaed because they were reporting on the grand jury. The, it's a, the Balco was the steroid scandal. Um, and uh, actually our security expert at Freedom of the Press Foundation used to work at Condé Nast and he used to go around uh, asking all of the reporters at all the various magazines uh, in newspapers that Condé Nast owns, whether they would, w if they want to learn about individual um, security tools. Nobody had uh, any interest, uh, especially the national security reporters, but there was one exception. The gossip columnists <laughs> were incredibly interested. So uh, there, there's, there's uh, a variety of topics that you can report on that have nothing to do with national security where uh, this stuff can be important. Next question. Hi, my name is George Mapp. Um, as Morgan mentioned, uh, UK and probably FBI look at some journalists as, you know, the enemy. Um, for some investigative journalists and other journalists who possibly might not under be under surveillance already, if you try to use some of these um, encrypted techniques and use Tor, does that, is there any truth to the fact that it might make you targeted? Like all of a sudden now, you know, you're using uh, Tor or you used Lava Bit before without a business or now you're using Proton Mail. It, you know, we, will you become sort of in a group specifically targeted because you're, you're trying to protect yourself? Like, like you said, some people, you know, some people think, oh, you know, just terrorists aren't the only ones who want to be encrypted, right? I mean, you know, you, you know, you see what happened to Sony. Um, I just want to sort of say, well, so, just one thing up front, um, so everybody in my, in my organization, so like everybody at, at I'd say the intercept, but everybody at the intercept, everybody at First Look Media has has a PGP key. Um, everybody also uses, um, very commonly uses Signal, sort of encrypted voice. Um, I mean, the, the 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 issue, what lights you up about using encryption is if nobody does, right? And so, I mean, I, I'm I'm actually not just interested in the security of my journalists. I'm interested in the security of the ecosystem. So, I mean, the more people use encryption, the um, the the less it, it, it signals you as, as someone doing something interesting. Um, having, having said that, for instance, as, as David mentioned before with the iPhone update, right, like if you, if you now send a, an iMessage, like a text message on an iPhone to somebody else it's, that, that has an iPhone, it's end-to-end -end encrypted, right? So, so I think, you know, the, historically there was, the, you know, there, there, is, there is truth to that, but I think actually the, the amount of, of secure communications that that is occurring is, is actually drastically ramping up, right? So you, there's, there's less of a worry now um, than there was historically, I think, about 
you know, using encrypted communications, making you seem suspicious. And it I was iChat so. itself that uh, yeah. that Prime Minister Cameron specifically <laughs> named as something he wanted to go ban. Now, it's such a nice one, tool. It is. <laughs> uh, one member of his staff made the point to me that that would put about half of his staff out of communication. <laughs> but you know. Yeah, just a, a, a quick tip if you have iPhones and you're talking to sources, using FaceTime on iPhone is much safer than using a regular cell phone call because along with iMessage, FaceTime is end-to-end -end encrypted. So you can actually do it. You don't even have to look at each other's faces. You can just turn on audio only, and it's a much safer source of communication than just using uh, going over the open cellular network. But I just do want to say on a factual basis that unfortunately it is true that using encrypted tools does actually put you. I mean, it just, I don't want to beat around the bushes here. The Snowden documents showed that the NSA um, considers encrypted communications to be an exception. And so although they are not supposed to collect the contents of US do totally domestic communications, they do have an exception for encrypted communications. So we do know that they are collected um, because they're encrypted. It hasn't stopped me because I figure, you know, let them take the two decades to decrypt it and hopefully by then it won't matter because we hope, right, we that it takes a long time to, to break the encryption. But I do think that um, it would be wrong to say that it doesn't actually raise a red flag. <laughs> well, I think it actually really depends on the population that you're a part of, right? Um, and so, for instance, I, I feel odd, for instance, I mean, I think that, um, you know, heavily encouraging people to use, you know, say, Tor in Iran has a very different um, you know, effect than heavily encouraging people in this room to use Tor, for instance. Um, so, I mean, I, I you know, uh, the I think the amount of encrypted traffic used by your your average sort of U.S. journalist now uh, is, is significantly higher than it was, whereas that. I mean, I guess thinking about specifically about your sources is an interesting one. Like, do you, are you are you protecting them or are you putting them at risk by by engaging in encrypted communications? Um, if you're convincing your source in, in the Syrian government that they have to start using PGP right now, uh, that that may may not be a great idea. <laughs> in terms of case law, I you know, in Tom Drake's case, this came up. Um, the government said he deserved heightened scrutiny because he was using hush mail, um, but in terms of that, I mean, I would hope that wouldn't discourage people from using encryption. The fact of the matter is that the government ultimately could not decrypt, could not break even his communications in Hushmail, which was much earlier generation uh, that he was using between the years of 2006 and 2010. Um, so it, while it may be an unintended consequence, I'm not aware of actual case law out there that says, um, you know, a probable cause standard is somehow lowered if people are using encryption. Last question. Yeah. Hi, Joanna Burnett. I just wanted to have two quick questions, but just wanted to add that I actually discovered Secure Drop by thumbing through your website. I uh, downloaded it, but I don't know how to use it, so I have it on my Mac right now. Maybe you can help me. <laughs> um, but uh, are there any email providers that are actually fighting the warrants? Um, you know, uh, Google just admitted that they came out, um, uh, that they gave the government um, uh, WikiLeaks uh, emails uh, two and a half years after the fact. It seems like um, um, in Google's case, the evidence we have on WikiLeaks was that they did fight those um, and fought to notify the people involved, which, Im which would seem to imply that they challenged those warrants. But the problem is these um, challenges take place in secret courts, and we don't know really how often people fight. We know from um, the fact that Yahoo went to the FISA court to try to fight some of the um, NSA surveillance, and they lost. I don't think these tech companies always have a great chance when they do these fights, but they, I, I think, are often not given enough credit that they do try sometimes. And yeah. part, part of the problem, too, is when the government uses national security letters on a company, um, that's another way to obtain user information, and that national security 
security letter, which is not the same thing as a search warrant, but it comes with a gag order. So the company can't even tell its customer there's been this national security letter that we received to reveal all of your information. Uh, the, the company's definitely, it's, as David mentioned before, uh, since the Snowden documents came out, there's definitely uh, much more of an adversarial relationship between the companies, and so a lot of them have stepped up their legal challenges. Um, unfortunately, as Julia mentioned, uh, this happens in secret often. Uh, they're often also going to challenge it up to a certain extent. They're not necessarily going to take it to the Supreme Court and battle for years and spend millions of dollars. And, uh, you know, even if they do challenge it, we often don't find out about it until after. You know, the most amazing thing about this whole James Risen case uh, was the fact that uh, ultimately he lost the, the case in the appeals court and he went to the Supreme Court and they didn't accept it, but he didn't have to testify because he was able to challenge it beforehand and make a, a big public spectacle out of the fact that the Justice Department was potentially putting a journalist in jail. When you have the secrecy surrounding these cases with the third parties like Google, even if they're challenging it, you don't have that extra layer of, of essentially PR protection, which is really important and, and, and has been important for decades when journalists are going up against the government. And, and I think that that's ultimately the, the real problem. You know, there's a, um, there's a legal concern here, and then there's also a political concern. So the U.S. government has pressed not only to use these national security letters that you just heard about and which the Obama administration put some very modest limits on when their announcement earlier this week about when they actually would make them public, but what we've done is set a, um, a precedent of extraterritoriality here because your emails you know, may be stored in the United States, but they may be stored someplace else. They could be in Europe, they could be in South America. In fact, many of these companies want to store the, um, your data close to wherever you live to solve the latency problem when you actually go to, to, uh, to get this information. And uh, by impressing the cases that the U.S. government has, they've created a precedent that the Chinese and others will certainly use once China builds servers, once Alibaba builds its servers here in the United States, where a Chinese court with all of its full independence from the government <laughs> will be able to issue an order and get a Chinese company, if you believe the US precedent would, would hold, to turn over data, maybe on Americans' uh, stuff, if it, it is stored in the United States in a Chinese server. So one of the things I think we need to do as we have this conversation is think not only about what the law says and what the judges rule, but what happens when the rules that we establish here in the United States get exploited by uh, governments that do not have the kind of constraints the U.S. still does. We saw that with the encryption. Act, yeah. actually. Uh, so, China just announced a couple, uh, like a week ago that now they want backdoors in the iPhones too. So I mean I I think that there's, in terms of you know companies fighting, oh, I want to say it's awesome that you downloaded Secure Drop. I'm glad you read the website and you got that tool. Um, so I, I actually remember Google did, I believe, and you can might be able to correct me on this, Google actually notified Jacob Applebaum that his, his email uh, had been warranted, subpoenaed in, in some way. And there was, um, you know, it came out that Yahoo actually went to bat against Prism. Um, and they, they tried very hard to not have to give the US government uh, their emails, and they, they lost, I think, repeatedly. Um, there's there's sort of a couple of, and of course, you know, LavaBit decided that they would rather shut down rather than um, be coerced by the government to give up the, the keys which in which were held the privacy of their users. Um, so I, I think it's actually, it, it, it goes back to, to what David said. We have this, this brewing battle, right, where I, I don't think, you know, the sort of mail providers particularly actually want to, um, to play ball because because the, the value of these companies is actually in, in the trust that they have with their users, right? Like, I mean, you know, the, the, the web 2.0 dictum is that if you don't pay for the service, the product is you, right? And people have realized this for a really long time. And so it's about the trust you have in these providers. Um, and, and, and so, I mean, I, I don't think that their, their desire not to play ball with the government is... Is, is benign, it, it's actually the fact that they realize it's in, in their best business interest, which is, which is why, they're, why this, this, this sort of front is coming and why we've actually seen, as I said, you know, the, the, the Googles and the Yahoos and so forth um, actually 
ineffectually try to fight against this. Okay, well, we have to wrap it up, but we will await the coming war between Silicon Valley and <laughs> Washington, D.C. Um, am, am I handing it to you, Emily, or are we just walking over? Yes, you don't have to. <laughs> too busy um, uh, protecting my own digital security by being on Twitter. Um, <laughs> Uh, that was uh, Julia, um, uh, Trevor, Jesslyn, Morgan, David. That was uh, unbelievably interesting. Thank you very much indeed for. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I said at the beginning, um, there's so much more work for us to do, uh, this is what I meant. Um, anyway, I too will look forward to the coming war. Grab a drink. Uh, we will be talking about the coming war in the room behind you. Uh, kicking off prim promptly at 6.30. As I say, there's a lot of demand, so if you want to secure a seat, go now, and we'll see you there.